week, we looked back, and we always look back before we look forward. We talked about the three people in the church. The Bible says that God made all men from one blood, no matter how different we may seem. We are all the same in our humanness. As the body of Christ, the church is made up of many members from a vast diversity of life experiences and Jesus is able to take our differences and build his church 
by building us. Last week, we learned from Acts chapter 16 that the first three converts of the Philippian church are representative of all members of every church, and we witnessed how the power that is in the name of Jesus changed each of them. From religion to relationships, Lydia, she uh, religiously worshiped the true God. He saw her heart and opened it to the truth of the gospel. To chase God, you have to know which way to go. From bondage to freedom, the possessed girl, she was trapped for profit, but freed for freedom. Freedom is only good if you walk in it. From secular to faith, the jailer, he was faithful to his job and family, but he knew there had to be more to life and was waiting for it. Life is good. Life with God is better. Whether you came from a religious background and you found yourself lacking a personal relationship with the Lord when God opened your heart to him, or maybe your life before Christ was one of bondage due to a destructive lifestyle, or maybe you were living a good life but were missing God in it, God has changed you, and he wants to continue to change you. So keep walking, Christian. Your path is set. Now this week, we have Pastor Gene with the good news. People out, as you can see, and people are you know, a little bit under the weather, but how many know God is good, God is in control, and all this is a passing thing, and one day everything will be the... I, I don't agree with the new normal. It's going to go to the good old normal. Amen. Amen. The, good, Amen. the good old normal. Yeah. yeah. New normal. No, that's a... That's a can I say hogwash? Oh, wow. Can I say hogwash in church? Yeah, it's hogwash. Right? <laughs> so how's everybody? Everybody's good. I'm good, you know, I'm good, you know, I, sometimes I actually even feel bad about doing good, you know, I say, well, everybody's suffering so much, but why am I okay? But I tell you, I have my moments. We all have our moments. I tell you, something latched onto me yesterday, and I say, what the heck is that? And they don't know, and I, it's, it's quick, as a pastor, I'm going to say, well, it's got to be a spiritual thing. Maybe it's my flesh. Maybe there's something bugging me that I'm confusing. So all day I prayed, I asked the Lord, Lord, is this something that you're showing me in the spirit, or is this just me being me? And I, in recent studies, we talked about wrestling with God and wrestling against God. And through a, a long day, probably longer for my wife, I finally I came to terms with it overnight. I think the Lord told me, you spend most of the day wrestling against me. I want you to wrestle with me. And when we wrestle with God, we're, we're on the same side. When you wrestle with somebody, it means you wrote both wrestling for the same thing, for the same cause. When you wrestle against something, you're in two different, you want to go in two, two different directions. The Bible says we are to, like uh, Jacob, he wrestled with God. He wanted something that God had and he had to wrestle for it, right? He wrestled with God, but the Bible says we are to wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness. And so sometimes that can be a challenge because sometimes our old flesh can get in the way or our pride will rise up, and I got this, I'm going to show this person and that thing, and we could start, you know, maybe over-spiritualizing. I know it's God talking, well, maybe not. Maybe it's just you. Amen? So, no matter how things may be for you today, I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to tell you God wants to encourage you today. So many Christians and non-Christians alike need a word of encouragement, so today... I want to encourage you, and the Lord wants to encourage us. I had this message I prepared all week, and it just wasn't sitting right in my spirit. And God said, throw it away. <laughs> so I didn't throw it away. I set it aside, maybe for a future date. I put a lot of work in it, and I said, just for, not for this Sunday. So he had to reset everything, and so I was, found myself. that Maybe that was part of it. I was wrestling against what I wanted against God. He had something to say, and I was wrestling against it. I don't know. So I'm trying to sort all that out, but we are here and we are excited, and God is still God, and God is still good. Amen. So today's message, standing in the midst of the chaos. Has anybody noticed the chaos? Yeah. That It's a little chaotic out there, and it's all around us, and the chaos can creep into our homes, creep into our hearts, creep into our thought processes, creep into our job places, and creep into the church and into your faith. Chaos is an invader. It's a tumult. It's a spiritual tumult or spiritual um, disturbance. But we 
by God's spirit can rise above and stand on the rock. Can somebody say amen? amen? The last couple of years certainly have been challenging times. And although we understand that the testing that many of us are enduring is not uncommon amongst men, the battle for a mindset of victory and not defeat can be a hard-fought one. As we continue to wrestle with God by wrestling against his enemies, news from the spiritual battlefront seems to be more negative than positive. This doesn't surprise God. There are those with an interest in putting us back on our heels. You know that? There are spiritual forces, whether through a person, whether through a situation, that are, have a vested interest in putting you back on your heels. That they may take ground for the territory that God has given to us. God has given you a territory. And it's a profound and important prayer that you say, God, expand my territory. If you want God to expand your territory, you have to stabilize the territory that you've been given so far. Amen? Amen. Today, God wants to encourage all faith warriors. Do we have any faith warriors in here? Amen. As we fight the good fight of faith. We're going to be jumping around the Bible. Let's go to, we're going to begin in 2 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Father, we just ask that you speak to us today, Lord, speak into our hearts, speak into our lives and into our spirits, Lord, that even today, even today, Lord, as you encourage us to fight the good fight of faith, Lord, that we take that right with us. We don't just leave it here somewhere, Lord, that we take it with us, move it into our house and into our hearts and into our homes and into our children, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We're going to look at the first thing. We're going to look at the first word of encouragement that God has for you today. God's grace is sufficient for you to get through. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. I want to put a little context for the last couple of chapters. The, the Apostle Paul has been writing and he's been warning the church, the believers in Corinth, the, the Corinthian church, that there are false teachers and wolves that have infiltrated the church and these false teachers are causing chaos and confusion amongst the flock and causing some to walk away from the Lord and into a false kind of doctrine of bad teaching that leads only away from God, away from faith in Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, he just here a little bit earlier, he talks about being going into having a vision. He goes into the third heaven, into the third heaven. What's the third heaven? Well, there's three heavens. The first heaven is our, the earth's atmosphere. The second heaven is the celestial bodies, the galaxies and the moons and all this beautiful stuff out there that God spoke into existence. The third heaven is where God lives. So he gets, gets out of the earth's atmosphere, goes past the stars, past the galaxies, past the meteors, past all that stuff, and goes into God's realm. And so he just talks about that in the first few verses of chapter 12. And he says, but I don't want to get puffed up. God has shown me amazing things. I can't. He even says, don't even tell anybody about this, Paul, but I'm going to show you something. He says, it's illegal for me to even tell you about this. I couldn't even explain it if I tried. And so he said, but I'm, just, I'm not bragging about me. I'm bragging about God. I'm, I want to stay humble. There's a danger of getting uh, puffed up if we start saying, well, look what God did with me. And it all of a sudden it becomes about me. Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh, a thorn where? In the flesh, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger, what's a messenger? That's an angel, but this is a dark angel. A messenger of Satan, for what reason? To buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For who? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So when we have nothing but anything, we have nothing left, I'm done, nothing else I can do. That's when God is made strong, because that's when we say, God, take over. So we are in He'll strengthen us, right? And so my grace is sufficient. So the first point here, God's grace is sufficient to get you through. This um, 
thorn in the flesh. I think it's real important that we kind of search that out a little bit. Why a thorn in the flesh? Well, if it's a spiritual thing, why didn't he give him a thorn in the spirit? You are body, soul, and spirit. And the, the fact that you understand where we are, you, you see me, right? You see me and you know what's going on here. That's your soul is reacting to your environment. That's your soul. And the fact that you're probably maybe hungry right now or maybe feel a little under the weather, that's your, your, that's your flesh. And your soul and your flesh are intertwined. The spirit is how you talk to God. God is spirit. We are spirit. By his Holy Spirit, we talk to God. You are body, soul, and spirit. When you came to the Lord, your spirit woke up. At the fall of man, our spirit went to sleep. Jesus came. You received him. Your spirit is awake. Now you're a trinity like God. You're made in God's image, body, soul, and spirit. So when God put that thorn in his flesh, he's talking about his soul. His soul, his soul is troubled. And when your soul is troubled, it affects your spirit. I was sharing that story yesterday. I was trying to sort out, is this my spirit? Is this my soul? Is this you, God, or is this me? I don't know what's going on. Is it my soul or my spirit? And so that thorn in the flesh, he's talking about in this reality here, in this, my understanding of my surroundings, my soul is troubled. My soul is troubled. So God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. No matter how spiritual we may think we are. I was doing, I was pretty spiritual until this thing got on me a couple of days ago. I feel, but all of a sudden, God humbles me. Ask any musician. Man, I can rock and roll. I can play for Jesus. I can rock some rock music for Jesus or some hymns for Jesus. All of a sudden, you can't do it. Why? Because God will humble us. When we get full ourselves, it's good for you to be humbled. So if God humbles you, say, thank you, Jesus. What was I thinking? And so Paul, God is, Jesus is protecting Paul from being puffed up because he is insufficient. How many know you're not sufficient? How many know I'm not sufficient? Go a little bit earlier in his writings. Go to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 5. He says here, in this context, he continues on that theme. He's writing about the false teachers. He said, they're showing up with their diplomas and there's recommendations from all over the place from these spiritual leaders and the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And they show up with these big papers and they show up, see, you better listen to us. That Apostle Paul, he don't know what he's talking about. He doesn't have one of these. And he's starting to say, well, that's insufficient. That's man. He said, I get my authority from God himself. And he says here in verse 4 of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, he said, we... And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves. It means my sufficiency doesn't come from me. It's not of me. To think of anything as being from ourselves, I have nothing to give God except my obedience, my willingness to serve Him, my willingness to bring the little I have. It's not of ourselves. I have nothing to offer Him other than my obedience. But our sufficiency is from God, who has also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. God says, I'm sufficient because he said so, not because I can do anything. God says, you're sufficient because he said so, not because you're so special. Sorry to break your bubble. But we are... All fall short of the glory of God. And that's where God wants us. That's where God needs us. And if it takes putting a thorn in your flesh to buffet you, he'll do it. I think a better idea is let's just stay humble so he doesn't have to put a thorn in our flesh. Amen? The things that trouble the flesh affect the spirit. Sometimes discerning between our spirit and our flesh can be a challenge. Paul was troubled in his spirit because a messenger of Satan was attacking his flesh. Although sometimes we may be under spiritual attack, we can react with our flesh. Who does he think he is? God, I don't understand why you allow that to go on. Can't you hit him with a meteor or a wayward satellite or something? God told Paul that his grace was sufficient for whom? Sufficient for Paul. 
as for that person. See, that's a spiritual angel. That's a messenger of Satan. So what's going on? What's going on is there was someone that had a demon in them. And I believe what was going on, the false teachers, they had a, a, a group of false teachers and they, they had a demon influence. And the leader or the, the main guy of that pack of false teachers was being used by a demon. And God says, well, take that demon out, God. I mean, Paul says, get rid of that demon. He goes, no, my grace is sufficient for you. As for that, I'll handle that. I'll, I'll take care of that. And so that can be a real challenge for us in ministries, for parents, grandparents, husbands, wives. It can be very difficult for us when that, our flesh starts rising up because, oh, man, that little demon showed up again. <laughs> And so we start pointing fingers at people, and that can be very challenging. So I encourage you, if you're home and there's something that's troubling you, maybe it's a medical thorn. Maybe it's a stress thorn in your flesh, a financial thorn in your flesh. However that's playing out, God's grace is sufficient, but His grace is not for you unless you say, God, give me your grace, and I move in that grace. Can somebody say amen? God's grace is sufficient to get you through. How about this? No matter the chaos in the world, there is peace in Christ. Let's go John chapter 16, verse 33. John 16. Verse 32 says, Jesus speaking. He said, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered. Where's everybody at? Each to his own and will leave me alone. So there's people walking away from God. You're being scattered and God's not leaving you. You're leaving God. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus says, I know, who, I know who I need to stay close to. I'm sticking with the Father. These things I have spoken to you so that in me, in Christ. Are you a Christian this morning? If you're a Christian, you are in Christ. In me, in Christ, you have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. We know that. But be of good cheer, child of God. I have overcome the world. Jesus said he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. When Jesus says he would build his church and the gates of hell would prevail against it, he was talking that there would be a force that would push back against his church. And if you're a Christian this morning, you are the church. There's a force pushing back against you and your life. And there's a, a, it's a worldly force. And the, we know that the leader of that world system is who? The prince of the power of the air. That's Satan himself. And he says, but don't worry. That's his realm for now. I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. The good news is that no matter the chaos of the world, there is peace in Christ. Amen. How about Philippians Chapter 4, 7. Philippians 4, 7. And Philippians 4, 7, it says that we need to stay connected to the Lord by having a personal relationship with Him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will be ours. How in the world can we have peace in the midst of chaos? The world doesn't know that. The world runs to and fro. The world hides. The world scatters. The world is looking for answers and doing all these things they do. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a lifestyle. Maybe it's whatever it is, a relationship. And they're bound and they're tied into that. And they're seeking satisfaction. And they're seeking through the relationship, through the lifestyle, through substance, through power, through money, through cars, whatever it may be. But that's all passing away. That's, that's a race. That's, that's a, a tumultuous place to be. Because the, the main example I would use is money. If you love money, you'll never have enough. You will never have enough money because you always want a little bit more. It's never going to be enough. How about you can never get enough of Jesus? I think that's a healthier place to be. If you're going to strive after something, strive after God. Amen. No matter the chaos in the world, there is peace in Christ. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 6. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus speaking. Chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, 
what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on it is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet they ha their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable to God than they? Which of you, here's a good question, y'all, and this is a trap. This is a really good question that Jesus asks you and us to consider this morning. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? You're not going to fix anything. Worry just kills us. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory, the, the top of the top guy, the richest of the richest guy, the smartest of the smartest guy, the, the, the king of kings in, in, by worldly standards, the wisest man who ever lived, he had the best tailors in the world, and they made the best clothes for him. He said no matter what he wore in all his glory was not arrayed any anywhere close to the lilies that God just sprinkles around and creates. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, O oh, you of little faith, O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Here in this context, we're talking about the non-believers, the worldly people. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, and he knows you need all these things. But seek first. If you want those things from God, do this first. Let's refocus. Refocus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these shall be added to you. How many know God wants you to be okay? God doesn't want you to go hungry. God doesn't want you to have to walk in the rain to get to work. And sometimes you might have to. But seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. God is a very wise God. He knows how you, he knows what you need, when you need it. And he knows that you might think you need this now. But I'm going to wait because you have to learn this first before I'm going to give you that. Amen? Because I give it to you now, you're going to lose it, and it's going to be gone. God is okay with you walking through some mud puddles for a while to get you to that, that dry place of peace. Amen? Amen? How about God will supply all that you need? God will supply all that you need. Luke chapter 6. Is this speaking to anybody? Luke chapter 6. He says here in verse 38, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together and running over. He will put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You're never going to run out. The same measure that you use, It'll be given back to you. How many know that you are called to be a living fountain, not a static pool? If you, I know people, maybe you know people who have been in the Word for a lot longer than me. They've been in the Word and the Word and the Word. And, and I believe there's a thing called, you know, there's, some dead, there's uh, seven deadly sins. One of them is gluttony. And I believe there's a, problem or a sin which I call spiritual gluttony spiritual gluttony it's like feed me feed me feed me feed me and all of a sudden you're just a pool you're just a pool and you're not giving out the Bible says that we're supposed to be fountains the more he, we, he puts in there we're supposed to take what we need and let it overflow and serve others he said to the measure that we give so give and it will be given back to you and the measure that, that comes out of you, he will replenish you. God will sustain you. God doesn't want you to be depleted. God will sustain you. And sometimes our flesh is depleted. There's so many people that are tired. We all get tired. 
And when our bodies are tired and our body feels depleted, we need a vacation or we need a, uh, to get away or whatever, maybe that's all good. Rest is good. Rest is good. But sometimes we can find it difficult to get into that place and rest and to separate ourselves. And it can become a pride thing. You know, what, the, what are they going to do without me? I think everything will be fine without you for a couple of days. And we gotta, that's a, a trap that we don't want to fall into either. God will give you everything that you need. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. How about one more? You got one more? God will always be with you. Go to the Old Testament. Old Testament, Deuteronomy. This is uh, the transition between Moses and Joshua. Moses, as we know, he led the children out of Israel through the wilderness wanderings. And now 45 years or so go by, and God says, I want you to take Joshua, and you're going to pass the mantle on to him. And so this is a transition between Moses and Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 30 Verse 11, I'll kind of set that up with a little bit of that, that we're going to be in 31. He says, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. God, if God tells you something, he wants you to know it. There's plenty of mysteries that God does not want us to know. But when he tells you something, he, you need to search it out. Say, God, what are you trying to tell me? And he says, I want to simplify this for you today. So that you can grab a hold of it and that you can apply it to your lives. It's not so mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It's right here. It's in your heart. It's in your spirit. Verse 12, it is not in heaven, this mystery that God has, that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. He said, you don't have to go through that much work. You don't have to go to heaven to get it. I sent my son down to bring it. Now, I mean, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. The word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. For what reason? That you may do it. It's a call to obedience. He said, you don't have an excuse. Don't tell me you don't have a spaceship to go to heaven so I don't have to. God, I don't have a spaceship, so what am I supposed to do about it? He goes, no, 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 that doesn't work. Yeah, but I don't have a ship to go across the sea and grab it so I can bring it so I can do it. He said, no, it's in you. It's in your heart so that you may do it. It's a call to obedience. And what's going on here, we all know what happened to the people in this first generation in the wilderness wanderings. They ended up dying in the wilderness because they not, did not enter into God's rest. Hebrews Chapter 4 says that they did not enter into God's rest. There it's talking about into, hey, God has been so good to me. He's been taking care of me no matter the chaos, no matter all this stuff. He's been taking care of me and my family, so I know all is well. And they, they, all they did, that first generation in the wilderness, was complain and say, I wish we were back in Egypt under bondage. And they were discrediting, they were... Uh, disavowing God's deliverance. God has delivered you. God has delivered me. There is no reason not to do as he would have us do. He says he wrote his law where? On our hearts. We all know what we're supposed to do. And so the transition happens, and then God starts speaking to Joshua, the new leader of the children of Israel, in verse 1, that area of chapter 31, but I'm going to pick it up in verse 5. God gives it. Joshua, a command. He's giving you a command today, everybody. God has a command for you today. This is not an option. This is not for discussion. This is not for excuse making. This is what God says to you today. And if he tells you to do something, you have the capacity to do it because God is with you. And what is that command? He says, be strong, verse 6. And of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them, those who are coming against you. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, and he will not forsake you. That's not a suggestion God says, no, I want you, I'm commanding you, because if you don't walk in courage, you're a bad witness to me. 
I am your sufficiency, and if you can't walk in the courage and the assurance that I am with you and I got this, then you're insulting my son's cross. Matthew chapter 28 and 19, the Great Commission, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He says, Now I am commissioning you, church, to go to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them all the things that I've taught you, which you're learning today. We're supposed to take it out and teach it to somebody else. Tell somebody. And then he promises, and lo, I will always be with you. Do you believe that? Do you believe God's always with you? God never goes back on a promise. And we thank you, God, that you are always with us. Today, I just want to encourage you. God wants to encourage you. I remind you that God's grace is sufficient to get you through. He wants to remind you that no matter the chaos in the world, there is peace in Christ. He wants to remind you that he will supply everything you need. And he wants to remind you, he wants to command you, because he's always with you, to be strong. And don't let your heart fail you, because all is good, because you are a child of God. When the Bible says that we wrestle against principalities and powers of darkness, worship team, it means exactly that. When it says that we should do all that we can do, and when we've done all that we can do, we must do what? We must stand. Standing up against the things that seem to be invading most aspects of life requires standing up to those who bring who want to bring us down. In Christ, you stand. And when you stand in Christ, you stand strong. And when your strength seems to be failing, we stand in Christ. Standing on Jesus the rock. He holds up in the midst of a spiritual desert of sinking sand and sinking homes. Stay encouraged, Christian. God would not have died on the cross in vain. The victory that he won with his blood, he won for your security. Does anybody receive that this morning? Amen. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your encouraging word. We thank you that it's not just a bunch of blustering words and words that just fall to the ground with no results, Lord. You said your word never comes back void. Lord, help us receive these truths and these promises into our hearts, these reminders, Lord, of who we are in Christ. All things are passing all things are going to look better in the coming season. The sun's going to come up. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. How many know that there's, nothing, there's no such being as Mother Nature? There, I'm sorry to tell you, you on YouTube. There is no Mother Nature. There's only Creator God. And the Bible says that his invisible attributes are clearly seen through his magnificent creation. And he says that man's hearts were darkened because they refused to acknowledge that God did this. As you look around, look for the beauty. That's where God is. Look at the oceans, the mountains, all these beautiful things that God created. God is still God. God is still good. And he's still on the throne. Can we say amen? Amen. amen. amen.
guys hear that message today? Yes. Huh? You, I'm not asking if you listened. I'm asking, did you hear? Did you hear that beautiful message? Yes. That strong message, that powerful message. A, a message of strength. And you know what's so funny? <clears throat> Pastor Jane was talking about thorns. The thorns of life. The, the anguish, the depression, the sadness. All those things of physical handicaps that we have, right? But I'm here to tell you today, I'm going to tell you, those thorns were on God's head. Huh? And he took them to the cross. He took them to the cross. So what does that mean? That means they were defeated. They were defeated. Those thorns were defeated because God took them to the cross. And when he rose from the dead, everything was defeated. So anything that comes into our flesh, into our mind, has been defeated by God. So we're here to stand victorious. We, I stand here because I'm in the hand of God. And that's what we all need to be. We need to be in the hands of God, knowing that we're victorious, that we're strong, we're able, we're capable. Not because of who we are, but of who we belong to. The most powerful God. There is no darkness. You know why? Because when we speak, we speak the word of God, the truth of God. And when God speaks, the darkness fled. It fled far away from you. So we don't need to claim fear. We don't need to claim defeat. We need to claim what God has enabled us to be. A child of the Most High God. Powerful, able, equipped, ready to make a change in this world. Not by our words, but by the word and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So everyone here, just raise your hand and say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your power. Thank you, Lord, for your light. Thank you, God, for the love that you give us so freely each and every day, God. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for our finances, God. We thank you for our children. God, we're just so grateful to you, Lord. And that's why we stand here, because of you, Lord. So we just thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're just going to sing it out one more time, church. Ready? Over every broken heart. Have a beautiful and powerful week. We'll see you next week.